Hey guys, I'm JC and today we're playing Yaver Nature's Herald. This is a creature focused deck that looks to abuse having flash and beats its opponents through either combat or combo. If this seems like your kind of deck, then make sure to stop by the channel where we have a deck tech as well as gameplay videos showing how the deck was built as well as how it plays out. Let's show our opponents just how powerful being able to play at flash speed really is. Alright guys, let's see who we're playing today. We have Urza Lord Protector, we have Titania Nature's Force, and to round it out we have Gonti Lord of Luxury. Alright, if we take a look at our opening hand, I think it's a pretty good keep. We have Turn 1 Ramp into a Priest of Titania, which is going to get us a lot of mana with Elves on the battlefield. And Kadama should hopefully let us cheat some good permanents into play. Also have some interaction with Kogla, so we'll keep this. Titania starts the game by playing a land for turn. And now they cast a Lanawar Elves. That's going to make our Priest of Titania really good. And that is it for them. Gonti plays a land. And then they pass the turn. We draw a Deserted Temple for turn. So let's play our Forest. And then we'll cast our Arbor Elf. And after that we'll pass it to the Urza player. Urza plays a tap land for turn. And then they pass the turn. Titania plays a land. And then they cast a Rampant Growth. They put a basic land into play tapped. Now they move to combat. They decide to keep their Lanawar Elves back. In their second main phase they actually use their Lanawar Elves to cast a Mana Vault. That might mean that we see Titania come down next turn. And that is it for them. Gonti plays a land for turn. Now they cast a Knight's Whisper. You draw two cards and lose two life. That puts them back up to seven cards in hand. And then they pass it to us. We draw another land for turn. Well, let's play our Forest. And let's get down our Priest of Titania. And if we can keep that around, then that means we'll be able to hold up mana to start flashing our creatures in. So let's pass it over to Urza now. Urza plays another tap land for turn. But it looks like that's it for them. Alright, let's see if the Titania player wants to get their commander down this turn. And that's exactly what they do. Titania says you may play forest from your graveyard. Whenever a forest ETB is under your control, create a 5-3 green elemental creature token. And whenever an elemental you control dies, you may mill 3 cards. Now they do play their land for turn, which triggers their commander. Now they get a big beefy elemental onto the battlefield. And that is it for their turn. Gonti plays a land. And now they cast Read the Bones. Scry 2, then draw 2 cards, you lose 2 life. So it seems the Gonti players just spend in their past 2 turns setting themselves up, hopefully drawing into some better cards. They might be looking for a board wipe here, because that is going to hurt both of the green players at the table. And that is it for them. Now they will have to go here and discard a card. And they just discard a Mind Stone. We draw an Apex Altasaur for turn. Well, let's start by getting our Deserted Temple into play. Now because we do have the mana to be able to get our commander out, but we do have flash, let's just pass the turn over and see what happens. Urza plays a land for turn. And now they cast a Metal Worker. Tap it, reveal any number of artifact cards in your hand, add two colorless for each card revealed this way. Well they didn't do much in the earlier turns, but Metal Worker is probably going to be one of the most dangerous mana accelerants in their deck. So we're probably going to have to keep our eye on them here. And that is it for their turn. Mana Vault will trigger on Titania's upkeep. They don't pay the 4 mana, so they're going to take 1 damage. Next they play a land for turn, a Scorched Ruins. They decide to sacrifice 2 forests there, and it does tap for 4 colourless mana. Really great land in their deck. After that they cast an Oran Reef Hydra. A 5-5 with Trample, whenever a land ETB is under your control, put a 1-1 counter on Oran Reef Hydra. If that land is a forest, put 2 1-1 counters on it instead. Now they move to combat. Very likely they swing with their commander and their elemental here, so let's see which way they go. Looks like Titania is going towards Urza, and the Elemental's coming our way. Well, we're happy to take the damage here. We won't block at all. And I'd say they're swinging their commander at Urza because that Metal Worker is scaring them a little bit. But after all that, Titania just passes the turn. Gonti plays a land for turn. And now they cast Mutilate. All creatures get negative one, negative one until end of turn for each swamp you control. Okay, well we weren't wrong there. They were certainly hunting for some sort of board wipe. I think we will respond here. We'll tap down our mana, we'll use our Arbor Elf to untap one of our forests. We'll float that mana, then we'll also float the mana from Priest of Titania. And then we're going to let that resolve. Now the Elemental Dying does trigger Titania, so they will mill three cards here. They get a Forest, a Kenrith Transformation, and a Defiler of Vigor. Now we'll use that mana to flash in our commander. 
Just a little unfortunate everything else in our hand is so expensive. Otherwise, we could have cheated something else into play. Would have been ideal to have another Mana Dork there. Lose the three float in Mana. And that is it for the Gonti player. Well, I'm not going to lie, that board wipe did hurt us a fair bit. Uh, but that's a beautiful draw off the top. We get ourselves a Somber Wild Sage. That's going to help cast our expensive creatures in our hand. Let's just play our Forest for turn. Now we'll move to combat. We'll hopefully try to convince the Mono Green player here to actually swing out at Gonti instead of us. So that's what we're going to do now. I'm sure they're not going to be too worried about us now. Our Priest of Titania is off the battlefield. And then we're going to pass it over. Urza plays a land for turn. Next, they cast an Arcane Signet. And then they follow that up with an Aether Sworn Cannonest. Each player who has cast a non-artifact spell this turn can't cast additional non-artifact spells. Well, that's actually a really great creature for us because having Flash means we can actually get around that on each of our opponent's turns. So the Urza player might be helping us here quite a bit. And that is it for their turn. Mana Vault triggers on Titania's upkeep. And it looks like they are paying for it here with Scorched Ruin, so they do untap it. And they won't have to take the damage. Titania player was definitely the one least hurt by that board wipe. Next, they do play a Forest for turn, which triggers Oren Reef, Hydra, and Titania. So the Hydra gets two 1 1 counters, and they make another 5 3 Elemental. Next, they cast a Kadama's Reach. That triggers the Hydra and Titania once again. Now we have to really hope that they don't swing our way, especially if they decide to swing two creatures. That's actually going to be quite a lot of damage. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of ways of gaining life in this deck. Now they move to combat. The Hydra goes towards Urza, thankfully. And Titania does come our way. Well, I guess that is the lesser of two evils. We won't block here. We'll just take the damage. And that is it for their turn. Gonti starts by playing a land for turn. And next, they cast a Blade Crafter. When it ETBs, each player sacks a creature or Planeswalker. Each player who can't discards a card. Okay, well, I think we're going to have to respond here. Let's get our Somber Old Sage into play. And I think we'll actually sacrifice Yeva here because Somber Old Sage is just going to help us recast her a little bit easier anyway. And I really value the mana generation at the moment, considering we lost a lot of our dorks before. And it seems, unfortunately, again, that the Titania player is definitely coming out on top. So we'll sacrifice Yeva. An Elemental getting sacrificed does trigger Titania, so they'll be able to mill three cards. They hit a Constant Mists, a Cultivate, and a Cultivator Colossus. Well, the Constant Mists is really good to have in their graveyard, because that card can be really hard to interact with. Especially in a creature-based deck like ours, where most of our win cons are actually revolving around our creatures and going in for combat. But luckily not all of them are, so we do have answers to that. I'm just thankful we don't have to deal with that this game. And that is going to be it for the Gonti player. Certainly struggling to keep down creatures this game. I guess this is going to be a real good test of the resilience of Yaver. What I'd really like to see actually is some form of card advantage so we could refill our hand. That would actually get us back in the game really well. Now on our turn, we do draw a forest for turn. Let's just play that forest for turn. And then I think this turn we're actually going to get down Kadama. It'll make a good blocker, which will hopefully turn the Titania player off, at least from swinging their commander towards us. It may end up getting the Hydra coming our way, but I'd really like to start cheating some permanents into play, so let's do that. And that was a little bit of a misplay on my behalf with the sequence in there. I really should have held onto the land first and then played it out so we could have an extra land into play. But not a major deal at the moment, so let's just pass the turn from here. Urza starts by casting a Scrap Trawler. When it or another artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, return to your hand target artifact card in your graveyard with lesser mana value. Next, they cast an Emery Lurker of the Lock. It costs one less to cast for each artifact you control. When she ETBs, mill four cards and then tap choose target artifact card in your graveyard. You may cast that card this turn. So when it ETBs, it will mill four cards. Let's see what they hit. Fabricate, Command Tower, Evolving Wilds and a Kappa Cannoneer. That's actually one to keep an eye on. That can get out of hand pretty quickly in an artifact heavy deck. But that is it for their turn. Mana Vault triggers on Titania's upkeep. It looks like they are paying the 4 once again to untap it. Next, they play a Forest for turn. That will trigger the Hydra and Titania. So now the Hydra is an 11-11 and they make another 5-3 Elemental. After that, they cast a Beastmaster Ascension. Whenever a creature you control attacks, you may put a quest counter on it. And as long as Beastmaster Ascension has 7 or more quest counters on it, Creatures you control get plus 5, plus 5. Well, that's definitely a very dangerous card with their creatures on the battlefield. Not going to be long at all before they all actually buff up and start killing players. So I think we're going to have to start putting our Apex Altasaur and Coggler to work, taking out some of those elementals. And they do move to combat. Let's see if we get hit with the big Hydra. And we do. 
They send one of the elementals towards Gonti. Titania goes towards Urza. That's going to trigger Beastmaster Ascension three times. We aren't going to be blocking here. It looks like Urza is using their Scrap Trawler to block Titania. The Scrap Trawler dies, which does trigger its ability. And they're looking to return their Aether Sworn Cannon Nest. So that goes back to their hand. And that is it for the Titania player. Gonti plays a land for turn. Then they cast a Crypt Ghast. It has Extort, and whenever you tap a Swamp for mana, add an additional black. And after that, they cast their Commander Gonti. That does trigger Extort, but they won't be able to pay. It has Death Touch, and when it ETBs, look at the top four cards of target opponent's library, exile one of them face down, and put the rest on the bottom of that library in a random order. You may look at it and cast that card for as long as it remains exiled, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast that spell. Okay, let's see which player they decide to target here. And they target the Titania player. And that is going to be it for their turn. Alright, we draw a Growing Rites of Itlamok for turn. A really great card, but not super useful just yet for us. Let's start by playing our land for turn. Next, we're going to cast our Apex Altasaur to start cleaning up some of the Titania's board. That triggers Kadama and Apex Altasaur. So we'll start by fighting Titania first. Titania goes down. That does trigger Titania, so they will mill three cards. Next, we're going to fight the Crypt Ghast. The Crypt Ghast goes down. And finally, we're going to fight Emery. That so will keep our Apex Altasaur alive. Make a good blocker against those Elementals. Then we'll resolve our Kadama trigger. We'll put our Cogler into play. And when Cogler ETBs, we're going to fight one of the Elemental tokens. So I think we've done a really good job this turn of slowing down the Titania player. Because if none of the other players had interacted with them, I think we would have all been in pretty big trouble here. Now I'm going to hold my creatures back here. We could certainly swing with Kadama, but I will be able to use this as a blocker if I need to to take out the big Trampler. I'm happy to block with Apex, Altasaur, and Kadama. So we will just pass right through here and send it off to the Urza player. Now, if we can actually keep our board state the way it is without any board wipes, or at least a couple of creature removals, being able to get down Growing Rites of Itlamok next turn is going to put us in a pretty strong position. So let's just keep our fingers crossed that we do keep our board state. Now, Urza does start by playing a land for turn. And next, they cast the Might Stone and the Weak Stone. When it ETBs, choose one, draw two cards, target creature gets neg 5, neg 5 until end of turn, and it taps to add two colorless. It can't be spent to cast non-artifact spells. They've decided to draw two cards with its ability, so they will put them up to five cards in hand. And then they recast their Aether Sworn Cannon Nest. So a card we're happy to see go back on the battlefield. And that is going to be it for the Urza player. Alright, well let's see what the Titania player has for us with four cards in hand. And an Aether Sworn Cannon Nest on the battlefield. They just start by recasting their commander. Then they play a forest for turn, which does trigger Titania and the Hydra. Now they move to combat. Let's see if our blockers are enough to turn them off swinging our way. And it looks like they are because the Hydra is going towards the Urza player. An Elemental is going towards Gonti, which is probably what the Gonti player wants so they can block and recast their commander. That also triggers Beastmaster Ascension two more times. Put in an up to five counters, but not the seven where it becomes pretty dangerous. Looks like both players just actually decide to take the damage. So Urza is down to 12 life now. And that is it for the Titania player. Gonti starts by playing a land for turn. Looks like they're tapping out for something big here. They're playing a Noxious Gearhulk. When it ETBs, you may destroy another target creature. If a creature is destroyed this way, you gain life equal to its toughness. Alright, well I have a feeling that's going towards the Hydra. Just so they can gain some of their life back. But I could be surprised. Maybe they do target our Apex Altasaur. Let's see what gets destroyed here. And they do actually go for our Apex Altasaur, interestingly enough. Well, our Dinosaur will go down here. And that will gain them 10 life, putting them back up to 32. And that is going to be it for their turn. We draw a Lanawar Elves for turn. Let's start by casting our Growing Rites of Itlamok. Right, unfortunately, we aren't going to be able to flip it this turn, which is a really big shame. But it might be able to find us one of our creatures that can actually draw us cards. Alright, so when we play that, Kadama and Growing Rites of Itlamok both trigger. So let's see what we find off the Growing Rites trigger. Ooh, and we get two very good creatures there. A Circle of Dreams Druid and a Sarath the Viper's Fang. Normally I never say no to a Circle of Dreams Druid, but I feel like we might actually need the protection here. So I think I'm actually going to take the Sarath. Now we'll resolve Kadama's trigger. We'll put our Lanawar Elves into play. Now we will have to move to combat here because we need to take out that Beastmaster's Ascension. So we'll send Cogler towards the Titania player. That triggers Cogler will take out the Beastmaster Ascension. That goes down. Let's see if they decide to block here. 
It looks like they are blocking with Titania. We're actually going to activate Cogler here now in response. We'll bounce back to hand our Somberwald Sage. That's going to give Cogler indestructible, which means it will survive, but we'll also be able to take out Titania. It might have been something that they weren't anticipating here. So damage goes through. Titania gets taken out. That does trigger Titania, so they'll mill another three cards. The graveyard getting quite full here. Luckily, it seems they haven't gotten into any of their card advantage pieces either. Now we're just going to move to our end step. Unfortunately, our growing rights of Itlamok won't trigger. That was the price we had to pay to keep Cogler around. Because having that artifact and enchantment removal, I think, is going to be really great against the Urza player. And Urza does start by playing a land for turn. It looks like the Urza player is tapping out for something pretty big here. And they cast a portal to Phyrexia. When it ETBs, each opponent sacks three creatures. At the beginning of your upkeep, put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. It's a Phyrexian in addition to its other types. Well, that has certainly made this game interesting, that's for sure. And this may have actually swung the game around in Urza's favor. In response, Gonti actually casts a Malico Rebirth targeting their commander. Choose target creature, you lose two life. Until end of turn, that creature gains. When this creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. Well, we have no response to this, so it means we're unfortunately losing all our board, making it that much harder to get our growing rights of Itlamok to trigger. When Gonti dies, it will re-enter the battlefield now. Let's see who they target with the trigger. This time they target the Urza player. And that is it for their turn. Titania starts their turn by recasting their commander. After that, they play a forest, which does trigger their commander to make a 5-3 elemental. So the Titania player really showing a lot of resilience this game. And that is it for their turn. Gonti plays a land for turn. Next, they cast an Oblivion Stone. 4 tap, put a faint counter on target permanent. And 5, sacrifice Oblivion Stone, destroy each non-land permanent without a faint counter on it, then remove all fate counters from all permanents. Now they're activating the Oblivion Stone straight away. Which is really great for us because we have the least to lose here. I mean, I would have really loved to have kept that growing rights around, but if it means it slows down the Urza player and the Titania player, I'll take it. Now that will trigger Titania twice, so they'll mill a total of six cards. And the really funny thing about that Oblivion Stone play was that was actually the Urza player's card, so we're seeing the strength of Gonti being able to steal cards here and use them against their opponents. But that is going to be it for Gonti. All right, let's see what we draw here. This has become a grindy game, so we've really got to keep our fingers crossed our draws are good. Okay, Sylvan Library is actually quite good. I think we definitely have to get that down here. Let's cast our Sylvan Library. And let's also cast our Somber World Sage. Get some more mana to be able to use on all those cards we're drawing, though sadly at 18 life. We're probably not going to be paying the 8 life for the two additional cards. We're just going to use it to filter here. And that is it for our turn. There's a Plays, a Tap Land for turn, a Myriad Landscape. Next, they cast an Ethereum Sculptor. Artifact spells you cast cost one less to cast, but then they ship the turn from there. Titania plays their own tap land for turn, and it is an Argoth Sanctum of Nature. Next, they cast a Rampage in Baelos, Trample, and it has Landfall. Whenever a land ETB is under your control, you may create a 4-4 green beast creature token. Well, it seems turn after turn, the Titania player is putting down these threats that really threaten big combat damage, which is not something we want to see when our life total is so low. At least it looks like they won't be making a landfall trigger this turn. And that is it for them. Gonti starts by casting an Explore. You may play an additional land this turn and draw a card. A nice gift from the Titania player. Next, they cast a Fell Stinger. It has Death Touch and Exploit, and when it exploits a creature, target player draws two cards and loses two life. So the Stinger exploits itself. They will draw two and lose two here. Next, they play a land for turn. Then they cast Sign in Blood, targeting themselves again. To draw two and lose two. But that seems to be it for their turn. Alright, let's see what we find off our Sylvan Library draws. We draw a Thorn Mammoth for turn. Sylvan Library triggers on our draw step. We get ourselves an Elvish Arch Druid and a land. We'll take four life to keep our forest. And I'll put our Thorn Mammoth back on top of the library. We'll play a land for turn. And then we'll pass the turn from here. Urza starts by casting Smothering Tithe. Whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If the player doesn't, you create a treasure token. A strong card, but nothing I'm too worried about just yet. At least while they don't have any card advantage to really be able to use that mana. And that is it for the Urza player. Smothering Tithe triggers on Titania's draw step. They don't pay, giving Urza a treasure token. And now Titania recasts their commander once again. Which now costs them a total of 12 mana. But they've been able to pay the cost every single time they've needed to. Next, they play a Forest for turn. That triggers their Rampage in Baylos and Titania. Now they move to combat. 
Let's just hope the Rampage in Balos doesn't come our way. And it doesn't. It goes towards the Urza player. That Smothering Tithe might have been a blessing in disguise for us. It might have been enough to attract the attention of the Titania player. But it looks like Urza has a response here. And they cast a generous gift targeting the Rampage in Balos. Destroy target permanent. Its controller creates a 3-3 green elephant creature token. Well, that is good news for us. That takes care of a big problem that we don't necessarily have a great answer for just yet. If we used our elephant to actually fight against that, it would have traded, and I really want to be able to keep our elephant to start taking out some of these elementals. But that's going to be it for the Titania player. Smothering Tithe triggers on Gonti's draw step. They don't pay. And now Gonti casts a Massacre Worm. When it ETBs, creatures your opponent's control get neg 2, neg 2 until end of turn, and whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, that player loses 2 life. So let's just respond here. We're just going to float mana with Somber Wild Sage. And then we'll have to let that resolve. At least we're seeing the power of Yeva here in being able to respond at instant speed. So we wouldn't be losing as many creatures as we otherwise would if we were just a normal mono green elf deck. So Massacre Worm wipes our creature as well as Urza's. That triggers Massacre Worm two times. We're going to lose two life. Next, they cast a Kaya's Ghost Form, targeting the Massacre Worm. Enchant creature or planeswalker you control. When it dies or is put into exile, return that card to the battlefield under your control. That's not something we like to see. Is the Gonti player actually planning to kill their Massacre Worm here and actually wipe out? It looks like they are. They cast a costly plunder. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sack an artifact or creature, draw two cards. So I think now we're actually going to come out of this pretty well. So now with the elementals dying, that will trigger Titania. They'll mill three cards. Then Titania will lose a total of six life here. But they can certainly afford to pay it, still being on such a high life total. Now the Gonti player will draw two cards. That uh, will trigger the Urza player's Smothering Tithe. And Gonti won't be able to pay, so they'll make two treasures here. Now we're going to harness the awesome power of Flash. We're going to get back Yaver onto the battlefield. Now Gonti moves to their end step. We're also going to cast our Elvish Arch Druid. And now we'll move to our turn. It looks like Urza has a response here on the end step as well. They're just cracking their Myriad Landscape. Well, that's good news. I got a little nervous there that they might have actually removed one or both of our creatures. So now let's move to our turn. We draw our Thorn Mammoth. That does trigger Smothering Tithe. We're not going to pay here, especially because Urza only has one card in hand. I'm not really worried about the Tithe. Sylvan Library triggers. And we have a Shaman of the Forgotten Way and a Reclamation Sage. Well, now we have to decide what's most important to us. And I actually think the Thorn Mammoth is at the moment. So we'll put Rex Sage back on top, and then the Shaman on top of that. We'll keep our Mammoth. That does trigger Smothering Tithe two more times. We're not going to pay. And because our life total is so low, we're just going to have to keep our creatures back on defense and see what our opponents do before our next turn. Urza starts by playing a land for turn. It looks like that's it for the Urza player. Maybe they don't want to resolve their commander here and expose it to the removal that has been flying around this game. Now it looks like on Titania's upkeep, a Genesis does trigger, so they must have milled that when they lost some of their elementals. At the beginning of your upkeep, if it's in your graveyard, you may pay three. If you do, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. That is actually quite dangerous. Let's see what they decide to put back into their hand. And they've certainly got all the choice in the world with their massive graveyard at the moment. The Cultivator Colossus could certainly be dangerous, especially if they hit a string of lands. They could also get back their Rampage in Baloths. Defiler of Vigor is also pretty scary. Even Avenger of Zendikar can do a lot of work. So yeah, they've got all the choice in the world at the moment. And it looks like they target their Defiler of Vigor. So Defiler goes back to their hand on their draw step, Smothering Tithe triggers. But they don't pay. Now Titania casts Parallel Lives. If an effect would create one or more tokens under your control, it creates twice that many of those tokens instead. Now they do play a Forest for turn. That's going to make two elementals. And now they cast Scape Shift. Sacrifice any number of lands. Search your library for up to that many lands. Put them on the battlefield. Tap, then shuffle. Well, I think they forced our hand here. I think we actually have to respond and take out Titania. Otherwise, they're potentially going to be able to kill every player next turn. So let's get our Thorn Mammoth into play. When it ETBs, we'll try to fight Titania here and just hope that they don't have something like a heroic intervention to save it. Otherwise, that may be the end of the game here. And thankfully, they have no response here. So Titania dies. That triggers her ability. They mill another three cards. We also lose our creature, so that triggers Massacre Worm twice. We'll lose two, and so will Titania. Now, we're certainly not out of the woods yet, because Scapeshift could probably find a good string of lands that are going to be very useful for them. 
All right, so they've sacrificed a good chunk of their lands here. Let's see what they get. Let's see what they're packing in their deck. Looks like they got themselves an Opal Palace. They had a Path of Ancestry enter. An Oren Reef the Vastwood. And also Yavamaya, so now we all have forests. Next, they cast a Nissa the Vastwood. When she ETBs, you may search a library for a basic forest card, reveal it, put it to your hand, then shuffle. And whenever a land ETBs under your control, if you control seven or more lands, you exile Nissa and transform her into Nissa Sage Animist. Now they'll go and find their land. And that is it for their turn. Alright, well we did stave off disaster there, but let's see what the Gonti player has for us. It's going to feel pretty bad if they have more removal, especially another board wipe. Smothering Tithe does trigger on Gonti's draw step. They don't pay. Now they recast their Commander Gonti. This time they target Titania. After that they cast a Regrowth. And it looks like they're targeting their Kaya's Ghost Form. Probably not good news for us. Very likely that goes on the Massacre Worm. But there is still a chance that they put it on Gonti just to try to get more card advantage. It looks like we get lucky here. The Kaya's Ghost Form is going on to Gonti. Now they move to combat. Do they swing with their Massacre Worm? They don't, thankfully. And that is it for their turn. So we draw the Shaman that we knew we had. That triggers Smothering Tithe. We're not going to pay. Let's see what we got off our Sylvan Library. A Karametra's Acolyte. That could actually be really big here in helping us get back into the game. So we'll definitely put our Reclamation Sage back on top. I don't think we need it for the Parallel Lives just yet. And we'll also put our Shaman back. And from here, we'll just pass the turn like every good Yaver player does. Looks like Urza has a response on our end step. They're tapping out for a lot of mana here. Is it a Cyclonic Rift? No, they're just using Urza's Factory to make a 2-2 Assembly Worker. And now we move to their turn. But it looks like once again, Urza is just passing the turn. So it seems having no access to card advantage is really hurting them at the moment. Now on Titania's upkeep, their Genesis triggers. Let's see what they return this time. And this time they get themselves a Cultivator Colossus. And their draw step, Smothering Tithe triggers. They don't pay. Now Titania recasts their commander for 14 mana. That also triggers their Path of Ancestry. So they'll be able to scry one. They play a Forest for turn. That triggers Titania and Nyssa. So now they make two Elementals. Nyssa will flip. So plus one, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put it into your hand. Neg two, create a Shire, a legendary 4-4 green elemental creature token. And negative seven, untap up to six lands. They become 6-6 six, six elemental creatures. They're still lands. They do decide to up Ticker. And they find themselves a Multani, Yavamaya's avatar. Next, they cast a Sylvan Safekeeper. They can sack a land, target creature you control, gain Shroud until end of turn. Well, that's going to be really great protection for their commander now. Now they move to combat. It looks like one of the elementals goes towards Urza. In fact, both of them are. Alright, that's good news for us. We can breathe a sigh of relief. I was a little worried they were going to come our way. Especially with the Sylvan Library on the battlefield. But I guess with two cards in hand, they're not worried about us at the moment. It looks like Urza blocks one of them with their assembly worker. Let's just hope we can punish them for that. Especially when they see our Karamatra's Acolyte and our Sarath. Both very powerful cards. The assembly worker goes down. That does trigger Massacre Worm. So Urza will lose two life. So that puts them down to three. They're getting dangerously close to being out of this game. And that is it for Titania. Smothering Tithe triggers on Gonti's draw step. And now they play Bubbling Muck. Until end of turn, whenever a player taps a swamp for mana, that player adds an additional black. Okay, well that's a little worrying. They might be planning for a really big turn here. And now they cast a Decree of Pain. Destroy all creatures, they can't be regenerated. Draw a card for each creature destroyed this way. Okay, well, we lose our two creatures here. That's going to be four life. This game is getting pretty wild, that's for sure. All right, well, in response, I guess we're going to float mana with Elvish Arch Druid. It will only be two. But otherwise, we won't have a response to that. That puts a huge amount of triggers on the stack. So Urza is certainly going to make a bunch load of treasures here. Titania is also going to mill a lot of cards, and there will be quite a few Massacre Worm triggers that go on the stack. I guess the one consolation here is that the Massacre Worm is off the table now, which means we don't have to worry about going wide here, if we actually do get the chance to do that. Because with so many cards in hand, it's very likely that the Mono Black player just wipes the board again if we get too crazy. So it's certainly been a pretty tough game for us, as well as Titania in one way, having the board continuously be wiped. But in all honesty, I felt like our deck has done pretty good. I don't think we've been out of it too much. We've always been able to bounce back into it, which is all you can really hope for when you're playing a creature deck against other decks that are wiping the board continuously. 
Now Kaya's Ghost Form will trigger. So that's going to bring back Gonti to the battlefield. Gonti's ETB targets Urza this time. So this whole game, we've been the only player that the Gonti player hasn't targeted for whatever reason. Next, they play a Cabal Coffers for turn. Absolutely perfect land to play with so many cards in their hand. They play a Soul Ring. Now they tap down their Cabal Coffers to add 10 black mana. Now they've got 16 total mana floating. Do we actually see the Torment of Hailfire go off here? Because that's going to be enough to get the job done. And that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. All right, well, I think that is the game pretty much done and dusted. We have no responses to that. But the Urza player actually has a response here. They cast a negate. Counter target non-creature spell. Wow. I honestly was not expecting that at all. The Urza player has been sitting there doing absolutely nothing. And there's certainly things they could have countered there. But that is absolutely perfect. That there is a really great demonstration of holding up a counter spell and using it just when you absolutely need to. So well done to the Urza player. So now in response, we're going to cast our Yaver. So it looks like we're still in this game, even if we're barely scratching by. And that is it for the Gonti player's turn. So now they will have to discard down to seven. But before they do, it looks like Urza's responding once again. Likely just making another assembly worker, which is exactly what they do. And now Gonti can go and discard their cards. And it looks like they get rid of a bunch of Swamps, Liliana, Hell's Caretaker, Doom Necromancer. Now on our draw step, we won't pay for Smothering Tithe. Let's see what we get off our Sylvan Library. A Return of the Wild Speaker and the Reclamation Sage that we already knew was there. I think we'll put our Rex Sage on top. As well as our Return of the Wild Speaker so we can draw that next turn. We won't pay once again. Giving them another two treasures. And then once again, we're just going to pass the turn and hope that we can actually land our Mana Dorks without them dying. Because once we do, I think we'll be able to get ourselves back into this game. I guess that's mostly going to be up to the mono black player and just how much removal they decide to cast. So now let's move to the Urza player's turn and see if they can top deck into something good, especially with all that access to that mana they have there. Urza starts by casting a Phyrexian Metamorph. You may have it ETB as a copy of any artifact or creature on the battlefield, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. Okay, let's see what they go for here. I think it might be Gonti, just so they have some access to card advantage. And that's what the Phyrexian Metamorph becomes. Now who do they target with the ability? They're targeting Titania here. That is good for us because they might have taken the Return of the Wild Speaker off the top of our deck. Okay, well, it looks like Urza is cracking a lot of their treasures here and from quite a lot of white mana. So I'm wondering what they actually got off the top of Titania's deck here. Is it maybe something like a Finale of Devastation that they can dump X into? And they actually cast a Metalwork Colossus. It cost XX to cast, where X is the total mana value of non-creature artifacts you control and you can sack two artifacts to return it from your graveyard to your hand. Well, at least now they're going to have something to do with all that mana every turn. And quite a good blocker while their life total is so low. But that is going to be it for the Urza player. Genesis triggers on Titania's upkeep. They're targeting their Cultivator Colossus. Now on their draw step, Smothering Tithe triggers. They don't pay. Now Titania casts Splendid Reclamation. Return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Well, I'm sure they would have loved to have cast that with their commander out. But it's still going to be quite worrying, especially if they have any access to card draw in their hand. Alright, and their battlefield has changed quite a bit there, so they're definitely going to have enough mana to cast their commander basically until this game ends. After that, they cast Praetor's Cancel. Return all cards from your graveyard to your hand, exile it, you have no maximum hand size for the rest of the game. Well, this turn turned around pretty quickly for the Titania player. Now I'm not too sure how much of a chance we actually have here. I mean, at least with the Metalwork Colossus, if the Urza player is still alive, we might actually be able to take them out just by swinging in with a mass amount of damage. So I think that's what we're going to have to try here. Unless, of course, they have a beast within within their hand. I didn't actually see that in their graveyard, so I'm not really too sure. That would probably be about the only thing that would save them here. That or something like a Nature's Claim, which takes out artifacts. But now Titania casts a Zurin Orb. Sack a land, you gain two life. All right, well, that plan's gone out the window now. I've really just got to shut my mouth because every time I say something, they just play a worse and worse card for whatever scenario I'm describing. Next, Titania casts Territorial Scythe Cat. Trample, and whenever a land DTB is under your control, put a 1-1 counter on it. Alright, well, they are tapped out now. Now they sacrifice to Forest to gain 2 life. They do the same again. So let's see how many times they decide to do it here. And it seems they decided to do it 4 more times, taking them up to 31 life. But it looks like that's it for their turn. 
All right, well, the Gonti player was able to draw a lot of cards and filter down to what's likely to be a good seven. Let's see what they have for us here. Maybe they have a chance to end the game once again. Smothering Tight does trigger on their draw step. Next, they play a land for turn. Now they cast an Undying Evil targeting their commander. Target creature gains Undying until end of turn. Very indicative that there may be a board wipe coming once again. Now they cast an Animate Dead targeting our Kadama of the East Tree. Okay, quite interesting. Let's see what they plan to cheat in here with Kadama. Next, they cast a Merciless Executioner. When it ETBs, each player sacks a creature. Okay, well, as much as I don't like it, I think now is the time for us to respond. Let's start by casting our Karametra's Acolyte. And we'll also cast our Shaman of the Forgotten Ways. I know we are basically dumping out our hand here, and if our opponent has something like a Toxic Deluge, we're pretty much going to be up you-know-what creek without a paddle, but I think we're just forced into this situation. Because when Tartania gets back to their turn, it's going to be big problems for the rest of us, no matter how many board wipes the Gonti player has. And when the execution ETBs, that also triggers Kadama. We'll sacrifice Yeva here. Our opponent sacrificed their Gonti, which they will bring back thanks to Undyne. When Gonti comes back, that also triggers Kadama. Let's see where they point the Gonti trigger. And once again, they point it towards Titania. Off the first trigger, they cheat into play a Phyrexian Arena. And the second trigger, they just put a Swamp into play. Next, they activate their Cabal Coffers for 11 mana. Now they cast a Disciple of Bolus. When it ETBs, sack another creature. You gain X life and draw X cards, where X is that creature's power. Well, if Kadama goes down here, that should draw him a good amount of cards. When it ETBs, that also triggers Kadama. And indeed, Kadama is the one they sacrifice. They will trigger Smothering Tithe a bunch of times, but I doubt they'll pay for it. And that last Kadama trigger, they just put another land into play. Now they cast a Grey Merchant of Asphodel. When it ETBs, each opponent loses X life, where X is your devotion to black. You gain life equal to the life lost this way. Well, that's definitely going to be the end for two of us here. Us and Urza are out of the game thanks to that Grey Merchant. And Urza can't come to our rescue either this time, having zero cards in hand. The Grey Merchant will enter. They'll have a Devotion of eight. So now that only leaves Titania and Gonti left. Now I've got to say, my money is definitely on the Mono Green player, with 38 cards in hand. Now it looks like Gonti also casts Feign Death until end of turn. Target creature gains. When this creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control with a 1-1 counter on it. And they did target Gonti with that. Now they sacrifice their Grey Merchant of Asphodel and cast Diabolic Intent. As an additional cost to cast this spell, sack a creature. Search your library for a card. Put that card into your hand, then shuffle. Okay, well the Tutor effect is very strong here, but I'm not too sure what they could get that could actually take the Titania player out. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm actually incorrect there. The Feign Death was targeted in the Grey Merchant of Asphodel. That's what's actually come back to the battlefield here. Now Gonti casts Living Death. Each player exiles all creature cards from their graveyard, then sacks all creatures they control, then puts all cards they exiled this way onto the battlefield. That's actually the perfect card for them, because Titania does have all their cards back into their hand. So Plague Crafter will trigger. Each player will have to sacrifice a creature. Massacre Worm's going to give all opponents creatures negative 2, negative 2. So Titania will lose 2 life here, but thanks to their Zuran Orb, they can gain that life back. And then Felstinger will exploit, being able to sacrifice a creature and draw two cards and lose two life. So they've decided to actually put the triggers in a case where Noxious Gear Hulk is going to take it out first, so they'll be able to gain the life from it. Which definitely makes sense. Mono Black decks like to pay a lot of life for their effects, so every life point does matter. And now we move to the Titania player's turn. Alright, with 39 cards in hand, let's see how much hurt they can put on the Mono Black player. Titania starts by casting a Kenrith's Transformation, targeting the Massacre Worm. When it ETBs, draw a card. An enchanted creature loses all abilities and is a green elk creature with base power and toughness 3-3. After that, they cast an Unnatural Growth. At the beginning of each combat, double the power and toughness of each creature you control until end of turn. That's a very strong piece with all the tramplers they have in their deck. I do remember they have a Multani in hand, which can get big very quickly. And with all the lands they have on the battlefield, that alone can start to really hack away at the mono black player's life total. Next, they cast their Cultivator Colossus. When it ETBs, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. If you do, draw a card and repeat this process. But it looks like they had no lands to actually put into play, so it just comes in as a 24-24. Next, they cast their Avenger of Zendikar. They will also be able to scry one here, thanks to using their Opal Palace. When Avenger ETBs, create a 0-1 green plant creature token for each land you control, and it also has landfall. Whenever a land ETBs under your control, you may put a 1-1 counter on each plant creature you control. So they're certainly going very wide very quickly here. And in combination with their parallel lives, we're about to see a huge plan army come out. And look at that massive plan army. 
I mean, the mono black player may have an answer to it, but still, it's absolutely massive. And I have a feeling the Titania player is going to be able to keep doing this turn after turn, putting out these big must answer threats. Next, they cast a coat of arms. Each creature gets plus one, plus one for each other creature on the battlefield that shares at least one creature type with it. So each plan is currently a 48 49, and their Cultivator Colossus is a 72 72. If they have a way to grant haste here, the game is all but over. Now they are moving to combat, so it looks like they don't have any haste enablers in hand. A natural growth will trigger, making these creatures absolutely huge. But without haste, this does give the mono back player a chance to take care of it all. And now they pass the turn to Gonti. On their upkeep, Phyrexian Arena triggers, so they'll draw a card and lose a life. It looks like they decided to pass on actually activating their Hell's Caretaker, which is actually surprising. I'm sure they would have wanted to actually bring back their Grey Merchant of Asphodel. But maybe they have other plans this turn. They start by casting a Reclamation Sage. And this was definitely one that was stolen from Titania. Now it'll be interesting to see what they actually target here. It might actually be the Zuran Orb just to stop them from gaining life. Because that's probably their only out at the moment for being able to take out the Titania player. And they are targeting the Zuran Orb. Alright, that's what I was thinking. So now do we see Titania respond here and sack in some of their lands to put themselves back to a healthier life total? No, they just decide to let it go, interestingly enough. I don't know, if that was me, I probably would have started sacking at least 4 to 5 lands. Because 12 is definitely within range of the mono black player being able to take them out. Next, they cast a Scheme in Symmetry. That triggers Crypt Gast, which they can extort. So it's starting to slowly sap them of life. Choose two target players. Each of them searches their library for a card, then shuffles and puts that card on top. Alright, now the question is, do they have a way to draw into that card? Gonti activates their Cabal Coffers. That adds 13 black mana. Now they recast their commander. So they're going to be able to steal whatever they want off the top of Titania's library. That's actually a really spicy synergy there with that card. It also triggers Crypt Gas, so they'll be able to extort it. But let's see if they can use the card that Titania tutored to the top of their library. Next, they sacrifice their Doom Necromancer, targeting their Grey Merchant of Asphodel. So it looks like they might actually be able to get it done here. That's 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And it looks like that is it. The mono green player is conceded, and that is the game done there, guys. All right, let's go to the review and discuss what happened. Well, that was one of the hardest games I've played with Yaver in quite a while. Pretty much after turn three, it seemed like we always encountered either an Edict Effect or a Board Wipe, and it was a really big struggle for us to gain any traction. But in saying this, it felt like we were close to getting ahead throughout most of the game, and it never really felt like we were out of it. In the end, it was actually the incremental life loss that ended up being our biggest downfall, and had we had any other card advantage piece besides our Sylvan Library on the battlefield, I think we may have been able to have kept ourselves in this. Overall though, this was a really enjoyable game. There was a lot of back and forth, everyone was interacted with, yet no one was locked out of the game, and everyone got a chance to make some sort of big splashy play. In the end, I guess that's all you can ask for. Well, that's it from me today. Although we didn't get the win today, the grind was still enjoyable to play through, and we got to see some great plays from our opponent's decks. Until next time, guys. Yeah.